In James, John chapter 3, um, verse 16, it's probably one of the, if not the most familiar Bible verse, maybe next to Psalms 23 and uh, a few other uh, sections of Scripture. This is probably one of the most well-known because this verse It's like the meta-narrative of the biblical story. It's like the main point of the scripture. Like everything in the Old Testament, everything that follows, really is summarized in this statement. We understand something of who God is, um, his nature, his being, um, what God is like, but specifically what God is like towards his creation and uniquely towards us as humans, who if we li- read the creation story in Genesis, it's humans are kind of the apex of the creative work of God. And so there are all these other subplots in the scripture, but the meta narrative, the main plot of the Bible is this verse that, that we have as our focus for, I don't know how many weeks you'll be in it, but, but I get the privilege of covering the next words. Last week, Pastor Isaac covered for God, and this morning we want to look at so loved. And while I'm just taking all kinds of liberties, would, would you read this together with me? Um, can we read this all together out loud, say the word together? So ready, ready, one, two, three, go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. The compelling motivation for what God did Um, was love. And it's interesting when you look at that to think, well, how did God do that? How does God demonstrate his love? How How does God express us? How does God in particular show us his love? And he could have done it by giving us a definition of love. And just for the fun of it, I looked up a lot of definitions of love. A lot of it has to do with feelings. A lot of it has to do with emotions. A lot of it, lot of it has to do with affinity. A lot of times it's expressed in conditional terms. Um, there is a unique expression of God's love as it's found in this verse and throughout the New Testament that, that in essence, love can be defined as this. It originates in the, one, in the heart of the one doing the loving. It's not conditional or tied to the behavior of somebody else. So I love you, in essence, um, as a choice that volitionally I'm making. I'm choosing to love you. And it's not conditional upon how you reciprocate that love or how you behave in return. It's just, I love you. If you're a single guy in here, and according to the percentages or the statistics, the chances are that most of you will get married one day if you're a single guy in here. And I'm going to give you a little head start, like get you way out in front. One day, your wife may look at you and go, do you love me? And you're like, of course. Of course I love you. And she may ask, why do you love me? In that moment, be very careful uh, how you respond. Because if you say, well, I love you because you're such a babe, or I love you because you cook so good, or I love you because... Be careful, because now you're... You're securing your love for her on the basis of something of what she's done or what she can do or some circumstantial thing or some physical thing. And so now what if that changes? Does your love for her change? So here's the right answer, Tanya, advance. When she says, why do you love me? You say, I love you just because I love you. And I'll tell you why I say that. Because in the book of Deuteronomy, God said to Moses, you tell Israel, I didn't choose them because they were the most powerful nation on the earth. As a matter of fact, they were probably the least of the nations. But I love them because I loved them. It's like God chose. He made this decision that I am going to love you. But it's more than just integrity. It's more than just this willful choice I make. Because how many of you want to be in a relationship where you have somebody that just says to you, I love you. I said I would. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna. You, my word is good. I mean, but what if it's like, I love you because I said I would. And you can count on that because that's not going to change. But I want to love you. And at the heart of that want to is I want this 
relationship, not just to be this choice that I'm grinding out and living every day, but I want there to be warmth, and I want there to be tenderness, and I want there to be affection, and I want there to be kindness in this relationship. So when you're speaking of a definition of how God loves you, it's rooted in a decision he's made. I'm choosing to set my love upon you. But I want to love you. When I, I have three boys, 28, 26, and 23. One's probably going to get engaged in the next month. The other two, I've got pictures afterwards if, you, if, if you're interested. And uh, they, they, they're good guys on Jesus, really solid. But I just, they need, they need my help, apparently. So, uh, so I'm, I'm here just doing their job for them. Um, but when each one of them were born, the minute I was able to get my hands on them, I did this with all three. I just went right into the corner of the, the room where they were born, and I just looked at them. And I said, Joseph, Thomas, Sam, your dad loves you. Your dad will always love you. You can't do anything that would make me love you more. You, you couldn't do anything that would make me love you less more. I love you. And I'm always going to be there for you. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to abandon you. I'm never going to forsake you. And it's what I want. I don't know what they heard. I don't know developmentally what kids are capable of discerning at that age. You know, maybe they just saw something fuzzy and heard, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> But from my heart... I just wanted it to get into their soul that their earliest memories are expressions of love. Because that sets kind of the course so often. That at least that's what research says, that so many of our earliest memories have a way of setting, kind of establishing this thing in our life. And so, so when you, before you were even born, God was like, I love you. And this love will be expressed and this love will be demonstrated. The compelling motivation is that we have a God who so loved us that he decided to do something to demonstrate that love in irrefutable terms. Because if it was just a definition that God gave us of love, I'm thankful for definitions of love, but they fall kind of short in helping us to fully grasp and understand the nature of God's love. God's love had to be embodied. God's love had to be personified because love does something. Read 1 Corinthians 13. Love acts a certain way. Love behaves a certain way. It's more than just saying, I love you. It's like everything of my life towards you reinforces that there's no incongruence between what I'm saying and what I'm doing. And this is how God's love is expressed towards us. It's what God says, but it's also what God does. So love has to be a person and become a person because love happens to us when we encounter love. And so in essence, the way that God would love us is that God would show up personally. And let me show you once and for all what love is like. So God so loved the world that he gave. And what did he give? He gave himself in the person of his son, Jesus, who would live out not only the definition of love, but the intention of God's willingness and commitment to us, that it would never be in question. And we're going to culminate this morning in coming to a communion table, which acknowledges that at the core, a God who has loved me, a God who loves me. And this is what the scripture says. It's one of the eternal things, one of the few things that are eternal. It has significance in this life and in the life to come. Now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. So this is a love that will endure forever. And so how does God love us? God loved us personally. God loves us directly. God loves us intimately. So he sent his son. And so the reason Christmas is such a big deal to us is because it's the Focus on the incarnation. It's the when the word became flesh, when God clothed himself 
in humanity because the word wasn't flesh prior towards that. God was previously only spirit. You couldn't see him. You couldn't touch him. You couldn't, you couldn't literally, he was invisible to us to the naked eye. He didn't have a body. But the reason we celebrate Christmas is that Jesus embodied the love of God, who God was. And so at the incarnation, everything changed. I mean, God is unchangeable in terms of his nature. He's holy. God will always be who he is for all eternity. He's not going to go breaking bad on you somewhere down the road. Um, God is incorruptible. He's, he's unable to be altered in terms of his nature. And the scripture also says that God can't be improved upon. There's nothing that's going to just make God better than he is right now. So, so he doesn't have to change, but he changed in form. And the reason he changed and formed in the person of Jesus is in order to reach us, in order to communicate something of his heart and his intent towards us. And in all the religions of the world, that's, the, that's unheard of. Instead of us trying to rise to this level of who God is, God, if you will, condescended and came to the level of who we are in terms of our form in order to express what does it mean to be truly loved by our maker. And the reason that God would do this is because God is love and it shows his commitment to reach us and to communicate that love. So imagine this, people, we live in Oregon. People, we love a good cause. We love to save things. And I'm not, have no, don't read, misinterpret that. I'm all for being good stewards of creation and caring for our planet. But, but like, let's take kind of something general I think we'd all be okay with. Save the whales. And like everybody's like, I want to save the whales. It's like, okay, we agree that that's probably a good thing. How far would you be willing to go to save the whales? Would you become a whale? <laughs> like, would you take on the form of a whale? Swim around in the ocean? Talk like, Wee! you know, talk like that. Um, we actually watched a show once where this guy, a nature show, a guy said he could understand what the whales were saying, you know, and the guy's like, what's he saying? He goes, he's lonely. I'm like, no, you're lonely. You know, you're, you're sitting around. Um, I mean, would you for all, now listen, would you for all eternity be a whale to go save whales? So it's like God saying, for all eternity, I'm going to be clothed in humanity because I so love my creation. And for all eternity, Jesus is going to bear the scars of crucifixion in his body. This wasn't like, I'll pop down there, take on human form, and then I'll pop back out. Jesus has a resurrected body. This was for all eternity. My middle son, Sam, he went to college on a track and cross country scholarship, and he's always been a runner. But when we first discovered that is when he was three. We were traveling back to Seattle where we live from a trip, and we have all this stuff. Our kids were five, three, and about one. And so we had all this stuff that you have when you travel with kids. And we were in Seattle, and we were coming down the escalator to the underground tram that takes us back to the main terminal. And as we were coming down the escalator, I could just see the train was, the doors were open and people were packing on all kinds of, there's so many people trying to get on. And I just said to my wife, we're going to have to wait for the next train. And as I said that, my son Sam goes running and he jumps in the train and turns around. And just as he turns, the doors close. And off the train went. And I looked at my wife and said, I am so glad we have two other kids, because I'm gonna, gonna really miss him. Uh, um, teach that little stinker to run off, you know. Um, I'll tell you what, I shifted into a gear I didn't even know I had. It's like, only one thing mattered to me. My son was lost. And even if he felt bad for being lost, he had no capacity to figure out how to get back to me. 
I had one goal. It was search and rescue mode. It was like, I'm coming after you, son, and I will not stop until you're back in our presence. Just because it'll bother you the rest of the service if I don't finish it. Um, uh, <laughs> it was the longest two minutes ever waiting for the next train. And I stood there while my wife jumped on the train and I was going, in case he did the full circuit, I was going to stay there. And at the next stop, some people we had been on the plane with sat near, saw what had happened, and they actually got up and stayed with him until we got there. And so I'll tell you, you love people who help you find your kids. <laughs> like, I love those people. God's looking at humanity, and the scripture says all of we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has lost our way, and God didn't say, guess I'll make some new people. <laughs> God said, get me a body. I'm going after him. For this is why the Son of Man came, to seek and save the lost. We didn't even know how to love God. We didn't even know how to turn to God. We didn't even know to seek God. And God came to us. Why did he say, get me a body? Because he so loved. The compelling nature of God. If you read in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. And only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Because we're human. In order to set us free, God had to take on humanity and become clothed in that. If you read earlier in Hebrews 1, it says, it wasn't for angels that he came to save. It was for the seed of Abraham. It was for the people of the earth that he came to save. So how Jesus came in human form answers to the question of why did he come? Because he loves us. Why Jesus came is seen in how he came. Don't ever minimize the significance of our body and what it means to embody the life and the love of God, even to the point where we will have a resurrected body one day in all <clears throat> eternity. We're going to love God with our whole person even as we're loved by God in all that he is, Jesus was God's message of love to us. And the point that he's making is love has to become a person. Love isn't just saying the right things. Love isn't just having a proper definition of the term. Love is something that, that is lived out. Um, we all know a loving person when we encounter them. There's something about love that has to be expressed. And so Jesus even said, that, said this of his church. In the in last few years, it's been a very pol polarizing, very divisive, a um, lot of acrimony, a lot of um, division, even in the churches. And Jesus said in John 13 that the world will look at you and they'll know something about who God is by the way that we love one another, the way that we move towards one another. And mercy and the way we love towards, move towards one another in grace. That's why in 1 John 4, 9, it says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world. And in John 3, 16, as we said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I think it's appropriate that this verse is on Mother's Day. And as Pastor Reed said so brilliantly, moms have a really unique way of expressing and revealing the love of God. Um, moms know what it's like to, to just have children and they require everything of you. you. You kind of find yourself, it's like you're all in. When it comes to that, you never look at that little child and say, what can you do for me? Because I'm, I'm telling you, especially when you have boys, it takes a long time for that frontal lobe to really come in, you know? And um, <laughs> last night, my... 23-year-old son wrote a card to his mom that just made her weep, made me weep. And it's like, like, it happened. You know, it happened. It's like, welcome back, son. We missed you. You know, it's like, good to have you here again. And, uh, but it, at a certain level, your child's going to die unless you kind of like saying, my life kind of takes a backseat for your life. You now become the focus and you become 
the priority. And so when we look at this astounding love for God or God's love for us, it has something to do with just the power of his commitment to us that's reflected in the incarnation. It's why he came to show us his love. Love has to become a person. The second thing, though, that I want us to see from the book of Hebrews is, is that because of how Jesus came, it changed everything about how God relates to us. Because Jesus said, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. I and the Father are one. I am the exact image of the Father. We are, we are indiscernible uh, in terms of the two are one. You don't know where one begins and the other ends. We, so Jesus has said, everything you know that is true about God is revealed in me, and everything you see revealed in me is true of God, the Father. And so how God relates to people, it was changed because of the way that Jesus came by virtue of how Jesus came. And it's easy if you read the Old Testament to think of a God who relates to people from a distance, who relates to people by virtue of laws, by virtue of regulations, um, by it's almost impersonal through rituals and sacrifice and temple worship. You're going to have this unique understanding of who God is in relationship to God. But when you think of Jesus, not only was he born and taking on humanity, taking flesh upon himself, the word becoming flesh, but he's the same one who then lived for 33 years. That he's the one who would understand rejection. He would understand what it means to be despised. He would understand what it means to be hungry. He would understand what it means to be alone. He would understand what it means to face the most hellish of temptations and persecution and opposition and betrayal that name anything that a human could go through on this planet. And Jesus had either a front row seat to it or experienced it himself personally. Firsthand, he faced what we face. So that's why in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 and 16, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So let's approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What is the writer saying? He's saying, you don't have a God up there in heaven who says, I have no firsthand experience of what you're going through. I don't know what it is you're facing, but one who says, I've been where you're at. And so when you lay in bed at night and you're fearful or you're praying or you're trying to deal with anger, or you've got disappointments or questions that are unanswered and, and you're trying to figure and it all out and you're praying and crying out from your heart, this is what you're crying out to, a throne of mercy. Somebody who is a high priest who is not untouched by what you're going through. Somebody who is able to sympathize and empathize with your very experience. And so you're approaching a throne of mercy, no longer a God who just deals with us according to the justice of his law, but he deals with us on the basis of his mercy and his compassion towards us because Jesus came and lived and faced what we encounter and walk through. He fulfilled God's just requirements of his law where we would fall short in that. All that the law demanded upon us and the sin that came into the story and disobedience that resulted in death and separation, Jesus came up under that and met all of that on humanity's behalf so that God in his justness could show us his compassion and show us his mercy. It's a throne of mercy we come to. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 says, for this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest in service to God. He had to be made like us in every way so that he could become merciful, faithful towards us because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus had to come as he did because love has to be embodied, has to be personified, has to be demonstrated, has to be shown, it has to be in a person. But the reason he came is because it changed now our understanding of how God relates to us. But then the last thing is it also changes how we relate to him. 
So now how do I relate to God? And communion will be so powerful as we come to the table this morning in light of this because it changes how we relate to him because now I don't relate to God on the basis of rules. I don't relate to God on the basis of regulations, rituals, obligation, or duty. I relate to God out of a relationship that I have had reconciled through the person of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.8, it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. I have been reconciled to a holy God, not on a righteousness of my own, but this grace that he has shown me, it's a gift and it changes. I'm not just going through the motions. I'm not just doing a religious obligation or duty, but I relate to God from the heart. That's how God wants you to relate to him from the reality of who you truly are inwardly. He doesn't want religious duty. He doesn't want obligation. He doesn't want just ritual. He wants it from the heart. He takes our heart of flesh, the scripture says, he writes his name on our heart, gives us a new heart, new desires, that from the heart we would seek him, that there would be something that's life and life-giving there. I was raised a pastor's kid, and... uh, had varying degrees of happiness about that as a kid. Um, But I had a job, my very first job in seventh grade, and I was growing up in southern Michigan, and we detasseled corn. That's the first job kids got, where you got like a company paycheck beyond mowing lawns and that kind of thing. So, So a group of kids from our church, we all got hired for this farm. This guy went to our church, and the DeKalb Seed Company, one of the biggest seed companies in the world, We got hired for about this three to four week window where all day long you just pull tassels off of the corn stalks because it was all about pollination and every seventh row you had to leave one with the tassels on. So it was all kind of hybrid. So they would just hire us and all day long we'd pull the the tassels or we would sit in these little buckets and the tractor would take us through and we would just pull and we'd talk all day and just kind of, that was it. And I got one paycheck at the end of that and it was the first time I ever got an official paycheck and minimum wage at the time was like $2 and something. And I got my paycheck and I looked at it and the sum, the net was about $200, let's say, just in that ballpark. And I began to look and it's the first time I ever heard of FICA. <laughs> it's the first time I ever heard of all those things. And so kind of introduced to the world of taxes and the social security and all of that. But my dad said, hey son, you need to give $20 of that to the Lord in church. And I go, what? Because, like, you know, we're going to give 10% to God. You're going to save 10% and you can spend the rest. I'm like, but I I earned this. God didn't earn this. I'm pulling the tassels. And so kind of like it was like, this is what we do. So I had two friends, Tom Mitchell and um, Nathan Carter. Their parents both said the same thing to them. And we were talking about it and we weren't thrilled. So we decided we'd do it on our terms. And so we went to the bank and we each got $20 of nickels and dimes and quarters. And so that morning in church, I had one of those old bread bags and had all this change in it. So did Nathan and Tom. We smuggled it in the church. And, and we never did this. We sat up on the front row. And then it came offering time. And I used to call it angry men in suits. You know, here come the guys and the ushers. And, and we had those old tin offering plates had the little felt bottom and, and they prayed and all of a sudden he turned to hand me the offering plate and I just pulled out my bag and I just went <laughs> just poured all the change in there my dad who was the choir director organist at the time he, he's on the platform he just looked at me <laughs> and then Nathan did it and we just like filled this thing like the usher was like you could tell perturbed like what am I going to do with this and we're like God got his money. And um, <laughs> so when we, we were going home, I kind of knew I was in hot water. And so we got in the car, and it was like quiet in the car. And we had an exchange student with Norway living with us. They had two brothers and a sister. And so we were all, you know, back in the day in the back seat in the station wagon with no seat belts. And we're going home. And we pulled into the driveway, and my dad said, "Um, everybody out, Randy, you stay in the car. (laughs) 
And so everybody leaves and I'm sitting in the back seat and it's just this long, my dad's looking forward in the driver's seat and I'm back here. Just this quiet, just long silence. Then he turns around and he looks at me and he says, son, I need to ask for your forgiveness. I said, why? He said, I failed you. Somehow, I communicated to you that God needs your money. That this is an, a rule. That this is a box you have to check. God doesn't want your money, son. God wants your heart. And this is one of those ways that God forms and shapes us inwardly is through trusting him with the first of our life. And, and it's an expression of our worship and recognition of who God is in our life as our source and our provider. And I didn't teach you any of that. I, I taught you a rule. And this isn't a rule. And so I want you to know, son, I apologize for that. And I'm going to give you your $20 back. And he said, do you forgive me? I said, of course. And don't ever let it happen again. <laughs> Hope you learned a little something from this. I'll tell you why that is probably one of the most profound memories I have growing up. Because it's probably one of the only times I ever heard my dad ask for my forgiveness, for his forgiveness. It's the only time I really ever recall hearing my dad say he was sorry. I had a good dad, he wasn't a perfect dad, but he was firm, kind of rigid. But he was very humble in acknowledging what had happened and how he didn't want the trajectory of my life in God to be set by regulation and rules. That he wanted me to relate to God from the heart. Hebrews 8.10 says, This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. Because it's written on our heart. What flows out of this new creation, this new heart I've been given in Christ, this new life in him and his life in me is a is a fountain of desire that's holy towards God. And I want to live from that place. I want to know him. Hebrews 10, 22 says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So let's draw near to God with a sincere heart. From the heart is the place we engage. From the heart is the place we live. And so when we look at this, how did God love us? God pursued us. God became like us to demonstrate once and for all what love really is and how he relates to us is in the basis of that love. And now he wants to relate us to relate to him out of that basis of love. And that's why the greatest commandment is this. You would love God with everything within you. It's from the heart. God pursued me when I didn't even know to pursue him. And now I want to spend the rest of my life laying hold of him. That's why the Apostle Paul on his deathbed, literally facing imminent execution at the very end of his life, who he had accomplished much. And he said, I still want to know him more. Still want to know him more. Because from the heart, we relate. And there's always more of God to know Relationships exist at the lowest level of willingness. If somebody says, I'm only willing to give you here no matter what you desire in that relationship, this is where it has to stay. But you have a God who went all in. He loved you with everlasting love. Loved you completely in the person of Jesus. Demonstrably has loved us, sacrificially has loved us. And God hasn't changed and he hasn't gone anywhere. And we're as close to God as we want to be. So what's in our heart? God, I want to rise to the level of what you've loved me with. And so this is the quest of my life. How do I know God? How do I pursue him from the heart? How do I seek him with all that I have? God didn't leave us condemned in our sin, lost, perishing for eternity. He came to us because he loved us. He didn't deal with this through legalistic approaches of ritual and rules and regulations. He deals with this according to his mercy and according to his compassion. 
And God doesn't want us to know him by just coming to a temple or coming to a building or coming to a mountain, go through the motions. He wants you to walk with him every day, to walk in his love, to be changed and transformed by his love. And out of that love, the scripture would say, you know how the world's going to know you love God that you can't see? Is by the way that you love the others around you whom you can see. God, you've loved me. Now love through me. I want you to bow your head with me if you would. And we're going to prepare to receive communion this morning. And an opportunity to keep coming back to that place again and again where the cross is the most ongoing reminder to us of the sacrificial nature of God's love for us, the lengths that he's willing to go to to show us his love, the resurrection life, the new life we can experience because of his death and resurrection, because of his love for us. And maybe in this time of communion for you, it's a renewal of from the heart. Maybe you've missed kind of identified God in your life and you're, you're still performing, you're still thinking, I got to check the box, I still got to show up and do that and be in order for God to love me. He loves you whether you do any of that or not. But his transforming nature and power in our life is to the degree that we receive that love and are changed by it. And maybe communion for you is that today. Maybe it's a reminder of the way that God has loved us so that we would now love one another in that same way. Grace, compassion, mercy. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus today, and maybe this is your moment of response. The Bible says if we believe in our heart that Jesus died and rose again and say with our mouth what we believe in our heart. Jesus, would you take my life? Would you be Lord? I surrender my life for yours, God. I lay down my life to take up a new life for you, with you. You'll be saved. It's this miraculous appropriation that the Spirit of God does, bringing what Jesus did on the cross to our behalf in this moment. And it's like a miracle of new birth. We pass from death to life. And then we begin a lifetime of learning to walk in the new identity we've been given in Christ. It's a, it's a journey of discipleship, following Jesus and being changed from glory to glory. But let that journey begin today with a simple point of surrender. Maybe communion for you is that. I surrender Jesus. I say yes to you today. I take your life as my own, in Jesus' name.